All right. Michael, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Dan, can you hear Michael all right? We got you. Fantastic. Michael, Welcome. tell us a little bit about what's going on. So, first of all, great to talk with Eric, longtime fan. Uh, I don't know Dr. Dan very well, but, uh, but great to meet you as well. So, um, I was raised a theist. Uh, parents are still very much in the Young Earth Creationist camp. And this particular film, you can find it out on YouTube. It's called Cataclysm from Space 2800 BC. Um, I was essentially, you know, made to watch this thing numerous times growing up. And it's essentially a, a very odd theory that, that couples with the Noah flood, Noah's flood. And I, I was very curious how it would tie in with your heat. I'm very familiar with your heat theory, and I was curious how this would tie in. Essentially, the premise, and I'm giving you the 20-second the version, but essentially the premise yeah, is the, the rains that were described in Noah's flood weren't the, the, the real cause of the trauma to the Earth. Apparently, an I, I, uh, asteroid uh, made up mostly of ice was set to collide with the Earth that hit the Rorsch's limit, it disintegrated, and the ice particles followed the Van Allen belts to the north and south poles, coating the north and south poles in ice, causing, you know, the ice age to begin, the, um, the gravity from the incoming asteroid caused the tides that eventually caused the bulk of the damage related to Noah's flood, you know, how the ark survived, I don't know that yet. But I've never been able to find a really good refute of this incredibly particular theory. We got you. You know what? That is a very interesting model. I don't, Dan, have you heard this one? It, it almost sounds like a combination you know of hydrophone and CPT to me. It's, it sounds, it's similar to hydroplane in that, right? You've got the, it's, it's a, it's an object instead of a canopy, right? But it's the same right. basic idea in that it, right? It comes from there, but then it almost like the collision induces CPT, right? Catastrophic plate yeah. tectonics. Um, I've never heard that combination of things before. Uh, it, it's certainly, it like it's certainly unique and I like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Like Michael, you have no idea, right? You know, it, We've been sitting here dealing with the same arguments from the same gathering of creation for so long. And when you hear something novel, you're like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is amazing. Something yeah, new. I'm glad I could bring you something different. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, so so right off the bat, right, um, with regard to the heat problem, I wish so badly that I could take credit for like discovering the heat problem, but more or less, I've just taken it upon myself to popularize it. The real folks who have like really dug into the math behind this have been a handful of scientists from the 1990s who are fighting against um, creationism as it was trying to worm its way into school. And then curiously enough, Answers in Genesis has like this series called like Thermal Problems with the Genesis Flood, where they're effectively having these multiple different issues that are posed to the flood of Noah, right? Uh, that result in insane amount of heat. Whether you're talking about the friction of the continents on the crust, all the meteorite impacts that have to happen during that single year long period or the radioactive decay. And they're like, what do we do with this? And there's been like, I think five now, um, like really long form articles released in their research journal because these young earth creationists have a research journal, but the peer review is scant to say the least. And, like, the answer to every single one of these articles has been, like, this massive multi-page article, and at the end, in the conclusion, they're like, ah, <laughs> we can't rule out a supernatural intervention there. Which, of course, as we know, is, is appealing to miracles. It ceases to be scientific. But the example that you've provided here, this idea that you've got this massive impactor event that comes through into the Rorsch limit um, and, and sort of creates these creeping glaciers from the poles, but in, like, really quick time, right? Like on super, a super accelerated ice age, already right off the bat, it's facing the same exact problems that every other flood model has to face, right? So one, you have to explain the, the continents and how they all seem to fit together into a, like a Pangea-like position. And if you roll that even further back in time, you get Rodinia, 
um, and basically continents are because they're sitting atop the crust and like moving on convection cells and like crashing into each other and then separating into multi-continents and then supercontinents. That's a lot of heat that's created with those continents on the surface of the Earth. And most creationists accept that there was a former supercontinent. But then you still have all of the impact events. You still have the hardening of all of the magma that's in the geologic column. You still have to accelerate all the radioactive decay. Like where all of this, this water comes from or like how the arc survives is the least of their problems. When you're talking about an amount of heat that collectively from all the processes that you have to take from a 4.5 billion year old earth at maximum and a 500 million year old earth at minimum, you have to squeeze all of that time into a single year, that heat vaporizes the granite crust every single time. Um, and, and the details are fun to talk about, but all right enough is that <laughs> this model faces the same problems as the others. Well, and in and... the video, it's, it's your typical, you know, asking a lot of questions and, and making a lot of theory, but Obviously, I think this, this film was created back in the 70s, if I didn't already say that. And he specifically mentions, you know, the tidal events from the incoming asteroid, not only causing water tides, but tides within the magma. And so I don't recall him specifically addressing the plate tectonic issue. And I assumed it, it you know, the, the heat problem would still be there, but he seemed to insinuate in, in the video that the magma, you know, the tidal events within the magma is what caused the sudden plate tectonics to occur. Again, obviously the heat wasn't an issue. There's also another subtle twist to this that gets thrown in halfway through. Um, he essentially insinuates that pre-flood, the earth had a greenhouse effect and the greenhouse effect prevented ozone from reaching the surface or the level of ozone we have now and that allowed people to age over thousands of years instead of a hundred years and that this asteroid event the the impact of the ice on the earth essentially obliterated the greenhouse effect and that was another major cataclysmic change and he wraps all of this into the you know could millions of years worth of evidence be accounted for in 5,000 years? It, so the answer to that question is no, <laughs> right? Um, one, so. thing, <laughs> right. one thing that jumps out at me uh, and my not geology brain, Erica is the expert on this, um, but the thing that I jump to when I... Uh, I hear this idea of an asteroid that has to be sufficiently large to generate, I'm thinking like, you know, ripples in a pond, right? Except it's magma and the, the tectonic plates are riding the waves and that's what moves the continents. So think about like the, the asteroid that at the very least contributed to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, right? Made a significant uh, crater. You know, we're talking hundreds of meters, uh, the diameter, the rim of that crater. Um, that, if I recall... Erica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was only about six miles in diameter. So you're talking yeah. like, you, you gotta be, and that killed the dinosaurs, right? As we say. So mm -hmm. that's got, we, we're talking about a significant rock here to, to um, we're not talking a big crater. We're talking literal ripples in magma, right? In the mantle. Um, but the arc survives. So the arc is not just surviving the waves in the ocean, it's surviving the waves in the mantle. Uh, and right. I, it's a wooden boat, everybody. I mean, like, let's just well, start there. It's a wooden boat. <laughs> yeah, it's a big wooden boat that's larger. It, it, this is like a complete minute point that I feel like isn't brought up enough because it's, but it is, to be fair, so far down the line of issues that I understand why it's not. But like the size of Noah's Ark is larger than, I think it's the, the, the Wyoming, the USS Wyoming. Like, the Wyoming, um, Spooner, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, like our largest, our largest wooden boat and it like leaked and foundered like crazy with it, the advent yeah. of modern technology. Um, and it, it isn't it like two thirds the size of Noah's Ark and made of wood or something along those lines. It was, yeah, it was the Wyoming. It was, I think, a six-masted schooner. It's the largest wooden vessel ever made. It survived, like, however many trips, and then it got in a storm. And because there was so much flex <laughs> in it, it got all, like, water was because it's made of wood. That's what happens, yeah. right? And water got in it and, it, and it sunk. And, like, 
there's a reason you can't build wooden ships that are that are that big because they they flex and then water gets in the joints. Yeah, I mean, like, this, it's is, an this is most of my contribution to this is that like it's a wooden boat. Erica has all the math on the heat problem and everything, and I have, but it's a wooden boat. A wooden boat would survive. It's it's a wooden boat. Yeah, like setting aside the fact that I mean, again, we're talking about the equivalent of over ten hydrogen bombs being detonated, not even A-bombs, hydrogen bombs being detonated in each square kilometer minimum, right, of of Earth's surface. That's the amount of heat that we're talking about here. Um, that if you combined exclusively the radioactive decay that you have to speed up during the year-long event of Noah's flood, because I noticed, Michael, you said, could you fit the millions of years that we have to accommodate? And it's not just a million, right? It's, it's 4.5 billion years worth of, of geologic column at maximum and at minimum 500 million years. So let's take the conservative estimate. 500 million years occurred during Noah's flood, right? Because that's what the creationists say, that the flood laid down the geologic column from the Cambrian roughly to the Cretaceous. Although, as Dan and I have been paying attention recently, they're starting to push mm. that a little bit. It's it's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of disagreement on Oh. <laughs> it's a lot of this. They, they can't disagree on where the flood ended, which, like, considering this is the biggest geologic event to ever happen, period, in the history of Earth to young Earth creationists, the fact that there's disagreement on where the flood boundary is, where it started and ended, is, like, concerning to say the least. But you're talking about, like, Dan's saying you got this wooden boat that is, you know, a third larger than the Wyoming, the largest wooden boat that foundered during a storm that humans have ever made to our knowledge. And we're not just talking about a storm. We're talking about the biggest storm of all time, according to Young Earth Creationists, during a year-long time frame that released so much heat from the speeding up of the radioactive decay, the movement of the continents on top of the crust, the hardening of all of the magma, the solidification and lithification of all the limestone, all of the impact events. We're talking about all that heat in a year-long period, mm -hmm. and the boat is made of wood, and it's the worst storm ever, and, like, it's just not going to happen. Right. Like, and so even if you've got like these interesting mechanisms and I, again, clearly this model, whatever it is from the from the 1970s of, of like a big impactor creating this glaciation at the poles, I guess it wasn't very popular in in contest with the vapor canopy model and CPT and Walt Brown's hydroplate if memory serves was like 80s, 90s, like around that time period as well. I guess those ones were just more popular, a little bit of a selection going on there. That was, so that was exactly what right. Those is, were the survivors coming out of the 80s, yeah, mm -hmm. those three. So what you're saying is, despite the, the mechanism being fairly unique, you're still dealing with the problem of volume, the volume of heat, the, the catastrophe of the waves that supposedly could, you know, pile sediment layers extraordinarily deep, extraordinarily fast, but here's a wooden ship surviving it all. Well, precisely that, and then also the geologic column doesn't record a single massive ice age, right? Like, yeah, we're, we're setting aside the intricacies entirely of, like, you can talk about the problems with Loa's art from, like, a macroscopic scale and then get more specific with all of the issues, and you can do this literally for months if you want to. Like, we could sit here and talk <laughs> about all of the problems for months on end. <laughs> Um, but moving True. inward, right, even just over the past 200,000 years, we see these glaciation cycles as, as the Milakovitch cycles of the Earth as it, as it uh, engages in precession, right? You can see the, the glaciers encroach on the equator and then recede, and then encroach and then recede, and then encroach and then recede. And, like, how is all of this supposed to be accounted for in what this model is proposing? It's like a single giant oh. ice age. Actually, to be but fair, though... To, to be fair, Jensen has an answer for the Ice Age thing. If you read uh, Replacing Darwin by my favorite, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, Harvard PhD, who works for Answers Harvard. in Genesis, his answer is, hey, look, I agree there was an Ice Age after the Flood. Scientists say there was at least one Ice Age. We agree. We agree. There was an Ice Age. We all agree on that. That was his answer <laughs> to the Ice Age. Is literally what he writes in Replacing Darwin. There's no further explanation. It's three sentences. It's one paragraph. It's, I said there's an Ice Age. They said Ice Ages. We're all good. Move on. It's a so, classic. How so many Ice simply... Ages? What? I, no, I didn't hear. How many? No, no, no. It does, how many? I didn't hear that question. I'm sorry. There's, no, we agree. Fun. We agree. So you can't, just, you can't just replace like when we're talking about the layering of sediment, you can't just increase the energy and the chaos and say that that you swap that out for time. 
that, that multiple layers were suddenly piled up quickly because we increased the volume of the chaos. Well, because cause think of it this way, right? Like the way that we reconstruct paleo environments of the past, whether we're looking, you know, 200,000 years ago or, you know, 10 million years ago, is we look at isotopic ratios within that rock. And one of the one of the, the different ratios that we look at is oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, right? To tell us what the general temperature is of the atmosphere um, when that when that rock was laid down, right? And we're talking again about this geologic column of 500 million years minimum where we see the oxygen content and the temperature within the the biosphere that we're looking at fluctuate in, in incredibly brief amounts of time geologically but vast time scales to us who have you know 100 year lifespans max and how how is the flood how are you going to create a mechanism within the flood to explain this kind of thing, right? The fluctuation of, of micro environments and, and local climates or the, the succession of animals. Why, why do they preserve in a specific way? All the way down to the plankton, which you can see evolving, quite literally evolving in their form through layers of rock that, that are only you know a, a foot, foot deep. It's incredible. It, it, did, did the flood just sort them that way? <laughs> we also have and this is i'm speaking outside my specialty here so correct me geologist if you're in the chat correct me but we also have things we also have things like um canyons that are subsequently filled in with sedimentation so you have a situation where the rock gets carved out and then it subsequently gets filled back in right so that can't happen when the whole environment is inundated in a flood you have to have multiple wet dry cycles for that type of thing to happen and yet we find that in the middle of what all creationists agree is flood sedimentation. How do you dig out a canyon and then fill it in with new sedimentation in the middle of a flood? You've got lithification yeah. that has to happen while everything is, you know, I mean, lithification, which includes drying out periods that has to happen. What creationists suppose is miles underneath the biggest flood of all time. Like, how are you going to dry out at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> while more sediment is being deposited on top of you over and over and over again? It's it's not feasible and, in any sense of the word. And one more small thing that I think is my favorite, just teeny little thing with the way the math works with the flood that comes, Erica. I don't know. I think. He, I heard this on your channel for the first time from our friend Jordan, that just yeah. the radiation that was released in the potassium in the people on the ark would kill them if you accelerated that rate of radioactive decay. The potassium in their body would be sufficiently radioactive to kill all of them if you accelerated it to the rate necessary. And I just love that teeny little fact that somebody yeah. took the time to sit down and go, how much potassium is in the human body? How fast would it have to decay? Okay, everybody's dead. Right, they actually did that math, and I love that little. Yeah, bit. no, and and Jordan is a, a, a he he does a lot of the physics stuff for both Dan and I. We're we're in a group together who's like he's you know a nuclear we, engineer. We, yeah, he's a nuclear engineer, but we like all get down together sometimes, and we're like, okay, like let's tackle this young Earth creationist idea and see from our different specialties like where the problems abound. And Jordan, Jordan has really highlighted just how problematic the radiation alone, take away the heat, the radiation in and of itself is just catastrophic. We're talking about the sterilization of the planet hundreds of thousands of times over, right? It's just, it's not going to work. So like start the flood however you want, hit it with a meteor, break the vapor canopy, initiate catastrophic like tectonics, do the tidal pumping. It doesn't matter how you start the flood. It doesn't matter how the flood commences. There are all of these uniform problems that Noah's flood from a young earth creationist perspective has to account for by their own admission, given they've been trying to solve these problems for decades and decades and decades, and they cannot solve because the problem is fundamental to our understanding of physics. Like it just doesn't work. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I, I really appreciate it. It's been very informative. Thank you very much, Michael. We really appreciate you calling in. Thank you. You guys have a great day. You too. You too.